Well, hello, Community Bible Church. It's Pastor Joel coming to you another video for our Exodus series. We're going to be looking at Exodus 37 today. If you watched our video yesterday, you saw that we are going through Exodus 36 through 39 this week on Sunday morning. But that's uh, going to be a summary sermon, and we're really going to be looking at how God expects us to worship through our work. So it's going to be a great study and really applicable to us today. But that's going to be more of a summary uh, sermon through Exodus 36 through 39 because almost all of this is actually stuff that we have already covered verbatim. And so if I was being a good preacher, you would say, man, if you went through that verse by verse, it would be the exact same sermon of what I did previously here. And so instead, what we're going to do this week, every single day this week of Monday through Thursday, at least, we're going to be looking through and just walking through this verse by verse, hopefully pointing out a few things that you may have missed, I may have missed uh, in our last time, and just hopefully bringing all of this to light. And so let's go ahead and start getting into Exodus 37. It says, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two cubits and a half of its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold, inside and outside, and made a molding of gold around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold, and on its four feet, two rings on its one side, and two rings on the other side. And he made poles of acacia wood, and overlaid them with gold. And he put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry the ark. And he made a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half was its length, and a cubit and a half its breadth. And he made two cherubim of gold. He made them of hammered work on the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub on the one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat, he made the cherub, uh, cherubim on its two so ends. Excuse me. The cherubim spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces one to another towards the mercy seat were the faces of the cherubim. So we are talking about here the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark literally means just a box, so the box of the covenant. I know that that doesn't quite sound as spiritual uh, for us, but that literally is what it means. Now, it's not the same Ark as Noah's Ark. Those are two different Hebrew words. I looked them up, actually. Uh, but this is literally just means the Ark of the Covenant. Now, they was going to hold inside of this box a few different things. Uh, one was going to be Aaron's staff. Uh, one was going to be a jar of manna. But then really the primary thing was always going to be the covenant. And we talk about what covenant is it talking about? What's well, the Mosaic covenant? The law, literally the Ten Commandments here. So let me show you a picture again of what this might have looked like. This is just one artist rendering, so it probably didn't look exactly like this, but just something similar to it. And so there's two pieces whenever we talk about the Ark of the Covenant. First is the actual Ark, which is a, literally the box. And then it was made out of acacia wood, uh, and it was covered in gold, both inside and outside there. Uh, and then inside of it would be those Ten Commandments, among a few other things things there and then the poles would go through because if you touched it you would die because if you touch the law the law brings forth death the book of Romans talks about and so you would never want to touch this people literally died because of that uh, but instead they would carry the priest would carry it by the poles there but then also the second piece when we talk about the Ark of the Covenant is going to be this top part the mercy seat this was all going to be a hundred percent complete gold and uh, this whole entire thing one piece and you see these two beautiful angels on top of it there with their wings spread out like this. Now, if you want a fascinating study, I encourage you to go back through and study Isaiah chapter 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, it's that vision that Isaiah has of heaven. And he sees the angels circling around the very throne room of God saying, holy, holy, holy. And God's presence is there. And because what we'll find out here in the tabernacle study, that this is kind of just a model of actually heaven. And so I don't know if as a kid you played with model train sets or Lego sets or something like that where you'd build a small little recreation of something. It was just a small little image of something much bigger and much greater because that's really what's happening here. This is what essentially heaven was going to look like. This mercy seat on the top with the angels circling around and then God's presence which you cannot see him uh, in the middle here. But then I love it because what's that area called? What's this lid called? The mercy seat seat the mercy seat and God could have said I'm gonna sit on the judgment seat and he would have been perfectly justified to do that wouldn't he have but for his people he said you know what I'm gonna sit on the mercy seat now once a year as we've already talked about the high priest would come in and he would take the blood of the lamb and he would spray blood on this mercy seat and that would provide forgiveness for his people for God's people for the next year now when we get to the New Testament in the book of Hebrews especially which by the way we're actually gonna be moving into the book of Hebrews 
Hebrews once Exodus is done here in a few weeks. But we are going to be looking at the book of Hebrews and what we're going to find out is that Jesus, after he died, he went to the, not the model of it, but he actually went up to heaven to the very presence of God and said, here is my blood now as a sacrifice for all time, for all the people. And, and so this is going to be just a small little picture of Jesus. This is all just pointing to Jesus. And as Jesus is going to go into this holy place, the very presence of God one day. But then let's go ahead and go out now to the holy area outside of the Holy of Holies into the showbread area. And so it says in verse 10, he also made the table of acacia wood. Two cubits was its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold and made a molding of gold around it. And he made a rim around it and a hand breadth made, and he made a molding of gold around the rim. He cast for it four rings of gold, fastened the rings to the four corners of its four legs, close, uh, close to the frame were the rings, as holders for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles of acacia wood to carry the table and overlaid them with gold. And he made the vessels of pure gold that were to be on the table, its plates, its dishes for incense, and its bowls and its flagons with which to pour out a drink offering here. And so let me throw up a picture of this tabernacle so we get our bearings straight here. The Ark of the Covenant was going to be in the Holy of Holies in the very back here. Then there's going to be a large curtain. And then the holy area is this larger rectangular area in the front that the priest would go into every single day day. And as they would walk in, they would take a look to their right, and this is where the table of showbread was, what we are talking about. On the left is going to be the lampstand. Right in front of them was going to be the altar of incense. But let's start with this table of showbread, right? And so here's a picture of what that might have looked like. Just one artist rendering here. And it was the only table in that area, so it would be essentially holding spot for everything that the priest needed to be held. But the primary thing was going to be these loaves of bread. There's going to be 12 of them to speak of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then I think uh, providentially as well for the 12 disciples one day that were going to come with Jesus as well here. But this was going to be the table for the bread and that bread would sit there. They would make it and they'd bring it in and it would sit there all week. But then the priest would actually go in and, and eat it on the Sabbath day. And what I love about this is number one is that all the other religions had something similar to this that they would bring in food inside their temple, but they would always sacrifice it by throwing it in fire to their God as a gift to their God. But here in, uh, in, in the, for the Israelites, how Yahweh related to them was like, hey, this is actually not from me. This is a gift to you that we can sit down essentially and have fellowship, have communion with each other. And that's just so beautiful because this is foreshadowing the communion that we get to have as New Testament believers. Because if you remember when the New Testament comes around, Jesus now breaks that bread as a a symbol of his body that's being broken and this is a picture for it. Then as well on that table there's going to uh, be the um, the oil to help with the lamp as well. And if you remember Jesus, uh, the night that he was betrayed, he was where? He was at the Garden of Gethsemane, which is an oil press. That's pointing to Jesus. They'd also have a drink uh, for the drink offerings as well there, which would be wine. Uh, and so it all points to this future communion here. And it all points to the fact that we also get to have communion with God. Did you know that if you are a believer, young, old, male, female, whoever you are, if you truly believe in Jesus, that you are also a priest, that you get to go in and have communion, fellowship with God the Father? Because that's the type of privilege that we have. Every single aspect of this is just pointing to the coming work of Jesus Christ here. And so let's move on to the next piece of furniture. Verse 17, it's talking about the lampstand now. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes. That's kind of like a bud, a flower bud. And its flowers were of one piece with it. And there were six branches going out of the side and six branches of the lampstand out of one side of it and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and flower. And on the branch and its three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and a flower on the other branch, so for the six branches going out of the lampstand. 
And the lampstand itself were four cups made with like almond blossoms with the calyx and their flowers and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out of it. Their calyx and their branches were of one piece with it. The whole of it was a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. I'm going to stop there for a second because you see it's one piece of hammered work of pure gold. So number one, it's one piece speaking of unity here. And what's beautiful is it's because whenever we get to Romans chapter 11, we see now that, that Israel uh, was already part of the tree of God. And you think over to John as well, whenever Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And it's talking about how Israel and his disciples were part of him then. But then in Romans, it says now that the, the Gentiles are also going to be grafted into that, but it's all one. And so there's great unity here. But then it says that it's hammered work of pure gold. Hammered work. Why was it hammered? Well, Jesus Christ was beaten on our behalf. Go over to Isaiah chapter 53 and read about the, the suffering servant. And he was beaten on our behalf. But the beautiful thing about hammered work is that when you shine a light on hammered work, because it would have been uh, had all sorts of rough edges and, and all of that, whenever you shine a light on it, it magnifies the light. And this was the lampstand. So the light was going to be magnified so much greater. And in the same way, Jesus Christ was beaten on our behalf. And because he was beaten and he was whipped and he was scourged and all of that, it made his glory shine all the brighter here as well. And so in verse 23, it says, and he made its seven lamps, its tongues and its tray, uh, trays of pure gold. He made it and all its utensils out of a talent of pure gold. That's a massive and heavy amount of gold here. And when we talk about the lampstand, it's really this primary, it's this vertical one right in the middle, but then there's three branches coming out one side, three branches out the other side, but it's all one beautiful piece here. And it's speaking of the unity now, but then also what we find is uh, it kind of actually is going to look like a bush. Did you catch that? There's flowers, there's leaves, there's, there's calyxes, there's all of this, and it's kind of going to look like a bush. And we say, isn't that interesting? Because in Exodus chapter 3, you remember when Moses talked to the Lord? He was speaking to the burning bush. And what did the Lord say to him at that time? He said, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. The Lord is here. And so this is now saying, hey, this is holy ground in this temple. This is holy ground. Whenever you come near this lampstand. And what's that picture of the lampstand of? Well, Jesus said in John chapter 1 um, that I am the light of the world, right? And so this is going to be a picture of Jesus Christ, even more so because if you caught what was the type of flowers that it was going to be? Almond blossoms there. And almonds were actually the first fruit. They were the very first tree to bloom. So in the middle of winter, when all the other trees are dead, the almond comes out and it blooms. And Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians is called our first fruit, the firstborn uh, of all the dead. He was the first one to rise up from the dead and we get to follow in his example. Every single part of this tabernacle is just pointing to Jesus in this beautiful way. And so in verse 25, it says, he made the altar of incense of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit. Its breadth was a cubit. It was square and its two cubits was its height. Its horns was of one piece with it. He overlaid it with pure gold, its top and around its side and its horns, and he made a molding of gold around it, and made two rings of gold on it, under its molding, on two opposite sides of it, as holders for the poles with which to carry it. And he made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He made a holy anointing oil also, and pure fragrant incense blended by the perfumer. Let me throw up a picture of this tabernacle here, just to remind us. So, we just talked about the lampstand, which was going to be on your left side when you came into this holy area. And then now we're talking about the altar of incense, which was going to be the very last piece of furniture before that curtain, before the holy of holy areas here. And we ask ourselves, what is this altar of incense actually a picture of? Well, frequently throughout scripture, that incense was going to be a picture of our prayer going up to God as a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord there. And it was right before the very presence
presence of the Lord. What's so interesting about this though, is if you know anything about incense, you usually have to actually light something or, or have something hot in order to make that incense really start to smell strongly. And this incense was the purpose of it was just to make this whole entire room smell so beautifully as a picture of just that God is also a beautiful smelling, um, a pleasing aroma as well. But we say, how in the world do they make it smell? Well, they would actually go out outside to the very altar where all the lambs were being slaughtered. They would then take some tongs, go grab one of the coals there and bring the coal back in and lay it in there. And that was what made the incense uh, start to really fill up the room. It was based on the coal, which was probably blood soaked by all the lamb that was going to be killed on top of that. And that's a beautiful picture for us as well because our prayers are going to be able to be answered by God only because of the blood of the Lamb. Jesus Christ laid down His life and because of that, then we have access to the Father. Our prayers can be heard because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. And so James chapter 5 talks about the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And that's not our righteousness as much as it is about Jesus' righteousness that was bought for uh, that was paid for on his behalf. And so because of his blood, our prayers now can go up to heaven and be heard. And because of Jesus now standing at the right hand of the Father, that he is now also our advocate and also asking the Father, petitioning the Father on our behalf as well. And so all of this, all of this is just this beautiful, wonderful example of Jesus. Because I'm often frequently asked in this book of Exodus, especially the last few weeks, about why did he go Go into so much detail on all of this. It just seems so repetitive. It just seems like it's so mundane. But really, every single part of this, and so much more than we've been able to talk about here, is all pointing to Jesus. And it was so important because the Old Testament is just the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so they needed to know that one day there was going to be a Savior that was coming here. And if they had their eyes open and their hearts open and were listening to Jesus Christ, they would start to see, hopefully as you are as well right now, start to see and start to understand that every single part of this is just pointing to this beautiful picture of Jesus. And so whenever you read about the tabernacle, what I want you to think of is say, how is this teaching me about Jesus? Because ultimately the tabernacle is the way that they related to God. Jesus is now our way to God and the only way to God. But that's what I have for you guys today. I will see you back here tomorrow as we go through Exodus 38. Have a blessed rest of the day.